Hello and welcome. My name is Mark Blatstein, the founder of Physician Pre-Sentence Report Service. The YouTube I'm about to record with all of you today is a PowerPoint presentation that I've used with uh, attorney groups so that you're going to get a feel for how, I guess, the process of how lawyers approach you, the client or defendants, and how they draw out information from you, the resources that are available. And I will make comments throughout. It is pretty lengthy, but I do appreciate you giving me the time out of your day to, to listen and to tune in, or if you're listening on a podcast, to listen that way. So let me try and share this with you. Let's see how this works. Give me a minute. And beginning. Okay, so I guess we're going to start, like, make, make me smaller here. Actually, start by making me even smaller still. So the pre-sentence, preparing, this is preparing your client for the pre-sentence interview in the first day in prison. It, most individuals, me included, because I had to go through this, is... Transparent transparency is a very big deal. I'm trying to clear this on my screen so that I can see. And so the points that I'm going to cover with this today is going to go through medical visits, co-pays. We'll go through that, the different types of medications, um, what you can expect, self-surrendering. If they don't know you're coming, I realize things have changed somewhat since I initially did this first YouTube in the fact that um, bear with me, that everything is done electronically regarding the information for placement comes out of the Bureau of Prisons in Grand Prairie, Texas, and it is electronically sent to individual, facil individual prisons. Of course, like everything electronic, it depends on the ind individual putting in the information and then getting it out. And so all I can tell you is that from my perspective, it's it's definitely worthwhile to make sure that or to request that your attorney check with the prison to make sure your information is there. Because if it's not, you can wind up from surrendering, thinking you're going to a camp or to a low, you can wind up in solitary confinement for up to a month. So that's not a good thing. COVID, well, for pretty much it's over, um, but it's really not. Um, if you've had your influenza or flu shots, COVID shots, bring documentation or your co copies of your cards. But COVID is definitely going to be with us for a long period of time, like the seasonal flu. And unfortunately, it's it, it's taken on, a, I guess, a political tone to it. But the reality is, is that the flu takes around 10 to 12,000 lives a year. The prediction is, is that for those who are not vaccinated, and possibly some who are, it's going to take anywhere from 50 to 100,000 lives a year. So I suppose let that be your guide. I don't think that's okay, but that's just me. Medications we're going to go through, dementia, that are, there are certain psychology programs, occupational trade training programs, first step back programs. Are they all going to be available when uh, when you get placed? Probably not. Um, and I'll go through why. But essentially, what's between staff shortages, COVID, um, they're just you know programs may be just filled up, um, and you may be not may not have access to them. Dementia. There's only one prison in the country really that has a true dementia wing. And there, there's only 35 beds, but we'll address that. If you're a veteran, there's actually one wing in the country that has 
excuse me, one prison with one wing that has, I don't know, I guess it's 25, 35 beds where uh, veterans train service guide dogs for other veterans who have either PTSD or, or other service di other disabilities. Um, but you can imagine that it's, you know, it's not a slam dunk that you're going to get in there. Um, there's then there's medical and mental health care services. There are care levels. Uh, what's a care level? We'll go through that. And then if you have a mental and mental health care care level, there's a difference. And what is the difference? Which takes precedence. And then there's code U eighteen USC thirty five fifty three. We'll go that go through that for a bit. Let me see if I can get this mouse to work good. We're going to go in through the pre sentence report. For those of you that have insurance, which is most of us, and if you need to see a specialist, you're going to get a referral most of the time. It's either going to be written or it's going to be in paper, but you're going to get a referral that someone's going to say, listen, go to this doctor, or it's going to be a written referral. If it's going to be for a specialist, it'll be for an orthopedic, for a hip, it'll be a cardiologist, whatever it may be. Your pre-sentence interview needs to be as accurate as possible because that ultimately what comes out of that is going to be your pre-sentence report and that's going to be your referral for everything going forward for the near future it's going to be a medical referral it's going to be a security referral it's going to be it's going to guide your life it's going to guide your life through all of your stakeholders your stakeholders are going to be people that are responsible for your future and helping you resolve your criminogenic needs, if you will. It's going to be your attorney, for example. Your attorney knows nothing about you, but as you begin to gather the information for your pre-sentence interview, they're going to begin to learn more about you. One of the things that they're going to need to know as you gather the information in addition to what you see on the slide in front of you, hopefully you're going to start writing your pre your personal narrative, which is going to be your story, what brought you to this point that caused you to break the law. It's going to be your, your version. Right now, the, your narrative in the public's domain is going to be written by the Department of Justice through your their indictment. That's their story of you. And it's been read by your colleagues, your family, the judge, prosecutor, everyone. And it probably it's not very flat, flattering. And so you need to take time to sit down and it could take, you know, anywhere from 20 to 50 to 75 hours through rewrites to begin to draft your own personal narrative or story as to what brought you to this point where, you know, you accept remorse, you accept responsibility, you understand the pain you've caused. And we'll go through that as we go through these slides. <clears throat> but through this referral, the probation officer, once you do, once you write your narrative, most of the information in the narrative is going to be used into the pre-sentence report. The probation officer, as they take in that information from you, is going to make the referral. When they, they're going to give it to the judge. They're going to say that Mr. Jones should go, should get this amount, this many years in prison. And they're going to offer their opinion or their recommendation. It doesn't mean the judge is going to take it. But if they have your narrative, in the pre-sentence interview, which made it into the pre-sentence report, along with a re-entry plan, because the judge is also going to want to know, what's your plan if you go to prison? Because I don't want to see you back in my courtroom. They want to know all of this during the sentencing hearing. And so that's a lot of work that has to be done long before you get to the pre-sentence interview stage. So the judge... <clears throat> The judge is going to go ahead and use the information from the pre-sentence report. And they come into the sentencing hearing. They know what they're going to do. Um, 
they're they're going to go ahead and base the sentence on what is in their pre-sentence report unless they go ahead and read your narrative and that says maybe we want to speak to this person unless then they're going to ask you that that may cause them to change their sentence but they're also going to know as they see your re-entry plan because they're going to want to know what's your plan for not coming back the bureau of prisons is going to is going to use this referral the pre-sentence report to determine your if you have a medical need if you have a mental health care need your medications you've gone through all of the medications that you take and you've matched them up against the medications that the federal bureau of prisons has they're all online they're all generic and you need to know are they available or are they non-formulary? And if they're non-formulary, these are medications that you and your attorney with your physician need to go through in detail. Because if how your own physician has them written for your needs doesn't mirror or doesn't match how the Federal the Bureau of Prisons has them written for their needs for you, then you need to get <clears throat> your your physician to document how for continuity of care within the community, for standard of care in the community, and for continuity of care, the medications need to continue. Or in addition to that documentation from your physician, maybe they show up at your sentencing hearing with you because the judge will want to speak to your doctor. Psychology programs and programs need these have some are security level dependent and may have limited availability. And so all of these are available on all of the first step back programs of which psychology program needs are available. And I will go through all of them in detail on another different YouTube, but it's important to understand that the criminogenic needs through first step back. When you first go into um, when you first get into prison and you have your first meeting with your case manager, your case manager is a stakeholder in your future. In other words, they have a vested interest on paper. They want to make sure you shine. And BOP staff, Bureau of Prison staff, case managers, they all listen to the same radio station, WIIFM. You'll find it a very well listened to AM radio station. It's what's in it for me. And if you can show them that you are showing incremental improvement, then you may shine for them. In other words, you'll make them look good. So criminogenic needs, when you meet with them, you want to be able to ask them if you can take the SPARK 13 risk assessment so that you can begin to participate in taking these classes because you understand that they could help you coming in as a felon that you can take these classes. And last are the U.S. Code 18, 3553, where these are looked into by your attorney to help mitigate the sentence. Healthcare levels, as I go through with attorneys and go through it here too, but there's four care levels. And very superficially, care level four is 24 seven nursing care, they're hospitals. And they provide the care all the time. And that's the only way pretty much you're gonna be able to get in. But you don't want to jump and say, listen, you want to go into a hospital setting because it sounds nice. No, they they have both violent and nonviolent offenders. So you don't want to jump in that at that unless you have to. Care level one is the opposite. Under seven, live with limited medical visits, limited, you're basically healthy. You have limited need clinically. Care level three, you you kind of need to get into a hospital setting. You just don't qualify because you don't need round the clock nursing care, but you may need assistance with activities of daily living, ADL, 
And they, you may need what's called companion aides or companion care, which are, these are other inmates or persons that are also incarcerated where they help you throughout the day, but you don't need care all the time. Sure. Um, prison activities of daily living are people that are teetering. It's possible that these individuals are teetering on dementia care or Alzheimer's where they are they get frustrated or flustered where, for example, the uh, they're told to stand up, but they don't want to stand up. You know, they're older and they get obstinate or they they're told to stand in line and to get in line for chow. And they just come wander, wander around and walk in line, butt in line to somebody else or they're in their own units and they just wander into somebody else's personal space and they can get and start getting in fights or and they don't know. And so, so what happens is that they wind up confused then at, due to the fact that they're getting reprimanded or getting infractions, then they get put potentially put in solitary confinement, which exacerbates more mental health problems. And it cas it's a cascading event that's just not healthy for anybody. Care level two is a majority of the population in, the, in any prison, in the Federal Bureau of Prisons, and out here in society. You know, you, you're taking medication, you're stable, and you're, you're okay with quarterly visits. That's the general population. Continuing. So, to medications. They're, they're on three tiers, as I call it. And they're either, they're all generic. They're either on formulary, which are available. They're non-formulary medications, which means that they're available, but the Bureau of Prisons really doesn't want to give them to you. They require a lengthy pre-authorization process, which can take from six to 18 months. And if your medication falls into that, then this is important for you and your attorney and your physician to identify these ahead of time. And if there's not an alternative medication that is just generic, it's time to get your physician involved and while they're writing the letter, they need to write why the other medications do not work for you, either because they've tried them before and these are this these were the results that why they did not work or other reasons why they are not appropriate. And lastly, medications that are not available where the BOP now will just choose and they'll use therapeutic equi substitution equivalents. They'll substitute therapeutic equivalents, which are medications that are different but have similar outcomes. And here, again, the physician needs to be involved. And what your, your doctor can do is that if there's nothing that fits that particular, that can be used as a substitution, they may need to the, ask nicely, see if they can attend your hearing because the judge will want to talk to them. And I'm not sure what will happen there. I mean, hopefully, maybe the judge can say that the ch sentence will get changed and you, you can be sentenced for home confinement detention. But if the judge still orders you to go to prison and orders the ju the, the, the BOP to make you know to to i don't know they they can order the bop to make an arrangement for your medication i'm not sure that they will but if they do then i guess it's up to your attorney to make the request of the court if they are if the bop is not able to make an an approved by your physician medication substitution for the BOP to notify the court in writing that that, was, that that is happening. Continuing, so in helping your, prep, your attorney prepare for the interview, you really need to be, you need to provide them with detailed copies if you've had these studies of everything. I mean, you all need all office notes, all surgery reports, along with the surgery reports. If there's pathology reports, you need them. Sure. If you had um, diagnostic text tests, 
x-rays, CT scans, MRIs, uh, ultrasounds, PET scans. You need to have those reports, but you also need them on CDs or flash drives. Uh, just the reports alone are not enough because while I was in practice, there's just too many times where sometimes I'll have the report and then when I go actually look at the film or the CD, I see something else in addition. You need prescriptions and prescriptions are not just for the medication, but they're for any medical device that you may have. It's for CPAP, BiPAP. It can be for any prosthetics that you may have, orthotics, canes, crutches, wheelchairs. If you use diabetic shoes, make sure that you have prescriptions for them and you wear it in. If you have eyeglasses, prescription eyeglasses, bring in a couple pairs with you, not made with steel frames, plastic frames, and have the prescriptions there. You want to have Copies of the highest educations that you've achieved. And, you know, it doesn't matter, doctor, lawyer, physicist, have your highest education level copies of that in your for your pre-sentence interview. Otherwise, they don't care. They're not going to take your word for it that you're a physicist. They're just going to make you take your GED. Military service, you need to have copies of that. Your highest rank, uh, any certificates that you have, type of discharge, rank, etc. When you have record, I mean, character re letters of character, not, not just letters of reference, or well, you want character letters about your character, as well as reference letters. And it's important to get these where they know that you're facing federal criminal charges, and yet you may likely go to prison. And that's important. Um, if someone, if a, if a current employer says listen you know when you come out i'll we'll do our best to hold a position or create a position or you know rehire you that's a big deal i mean you know, the understanding is it's still a business if there's if business is slow they can't but for them to put in writing that they're willing to hire you back again that's a very big deal that's a that's a great letter to have continuing so it's never too early to start preparing for your uh, pre-sentence interview. You, you need to just, you need to just do it. And you need to have, it has to be comprehensive. When you <clears throat> go, you, when you, as you prepare the, for the, inter, for the pre-sentence interview, At the time when you are at the hearing, when you are going to be requesting a placement request, you're going to want to go ahead and make that request based on a reason, a specific reason why you're making a that type of request. Um, it may be for family visitation or certain type of uh, vocational uh, type of training or a veterans program or a medical type program, dementia care, et cetera, or a psychology type program. And some of these psych psychology programs, a couple of which, I mean, there's only two, in, there's only two locations in the country. And again, I'll go through all of those on a different YouTube, but Judges are, once they're willing to accept a placement request, then making the placement request needs a reason. And they want to know that, you know, if you have a reason, it be it medical or you want to learn a new vocation, then that's something that they're willing to do. In addition, I referenced already, you want to make your personal narrative. Before you want to write that out before your pre-sentence interview, you know, you want to accept responsibility. You need to review your history, your prior criminal history, educational background, it'll all be there. And how you got to this point, how, how it impacted, how, you, how did you get to create this criminal environment for yourself? It has to be your story. Don't minimize the crime. 
And part of your reentry plan is what are you going to do not to reoffend? The judges want to hear from you. They expect your lawyer to speak nicely about you. That's what they're paid to do. They expect the prosecutor to want to convict you. They expect the Department of Justice wants to go into jail. And they, but the one person that they don't know is you. And so that's why this narrative and reentry plan is a big deal. Oh. <clears throat> successfully prepared for the pre-sentence interview, meaning that you have to have everything complete and ready for your probation officer. That's your medical, bio, biographical history, all your medications, medical devices, everything is prepared. Your narrative, it can be written, but you, you can also have it done in video format. It can be done professionally in video or can be done cheaply with a smartphone, the reviewed and edited, the reentry plan also. As I said, because the judge wants to, you know, wants to hear from you. They want to know why you're not going to come back to their courtroom. During the placement request, <clears throat> the judges want, you need to put in there reasons why, and it's usually associated with a program or a medical reason. So here I'm going to try something different. Let's see if I can actually get this to work. Well, oh, look at that. So this is what I put together. And so for someone Let's say this person qualifies for Alderson. And so this goes through. And so this is where the person program is going to be the resolve program for women who have either PTSD and so, or trauma and a mental illness. Plus, these are the other programs that are all available through the First Step Act. I'm pretty sure that all of them may not be available at every they're, while they're available at every facility, they may they may not be, some may be filled up. Other resources, these are other resources that are also available at Alderson. And then these are the programs. And so that are available so that you're going to be able to be seen. It's a female, it's a female facility. And so as you see, Alderson's the first one. And so it reviews each of the programs that are going to be available at this particular prison. That's a drug program, seeking safety. And so these are the programs that are available at Alderson. So I go through each of the programs that your attorney is able to review with the judge before you get in there. And they're all matched to... Uh, to they're all matched to you basically this is personalized and done and so let's see here that's that's what i mean each each of these packets is in, individualized for the individual which is a double negative and i apologize but at the end if all of a sudden you realize that you made a mistake in your pre-sentence report that's a lot of work. I mean, that's asking the court that has already adopted the pre-sentence report as accurate. That's a big ask to change their position. The statement of reasons is written, is written that's essentially is done to correct errors in the pre-sentence report. But this, this part in the middle to ask the court to change the position in the pre-sentence report that's a big ass and sometimes is very difficult and expensive to do. Stakeholders, I've alluded to already, but your stakeholders are going to be, I mean, the probation officer, they don't know you, but they're going to learn who you are through the pre-sentence interview and your narrative and your reentry plan. And they're a stakeholder because they influence your future. How do they do that? They take in the information and then they make your sentencing recommendation to the judge. In addition, <clears throat> you have the prosecutor who's going to read the pre-sentence report. You've got the Department of Justice, again, who wants you, who wants you to go to jail. And you have the BOP who, that you'll never meet. 
in Grand Prairie, Texas. They're going to use the pre-sentence report to go ahead and place you into a specific prison. Your case manager in the Federal Bureau of Prisons, that person is probably one of the most important people you're going to meet during your stay because they are going to be responsible for making your stay as a smooth transition through the federal, through prison or not smooth expedited quickly as quickly as reasonably possible into a halfway house and home or not the probation officer then when you're at home to supervise release and last it remains on your record for life so it's truly the gift that keeps on giving memorandum again the attorneys know this um it's filed the week before sentencing you review it with your attorney before it goes but essentially they research your case compared to other cases that are like yours in similar districts so it gives the judge a bit of a heads up on the best sentence for you but being that the judge already knows that your attorney is being paid to say and do nice things for you you know they will definitely listen to these other case these other case laws that have happened in air in other jurisdictions similar to yours um, but a lot of it's going to depend on you and how you interact with the court on that day on your sentencing hearing day this is the seven factors considered at sentencing. Um, and these are strictly procedures through 3553. You can skim them here yourself. But these are through the United States Sentencing Commission. My final thoughts on preparation is that the defense and you, because this has to be a partnership between you and hopefully your attorney, because ultimately this is your life. And so you and your attorney together need to determine what medical and non-medical information needs to be included in your pre-sentence report, understanding that accuracy and completeness is key. And the goal is to then to recreate is to have a placement request that is appropriate for your security classification but also includes if there is a medical psychological or educational program need and lastly and we'll i'll touch on this at other points where this was written initially during one of the higher points in COVID. COVID is now, it's waning. Plus, we've had a very weak winter, although right now I think it's middle March. And winter is kind of has hit the West Coast and North and the New, and New England, North Central New England. But COVID is still going to be with us for a long time. And it appears that the predictions are going to be the flu season usually has yearly maybe 10 to 12,000 fatalities a year. It could be that COVID is going to have anywhere from 50 to 75,000 deaths a year. I don't think that that is okay, but that appears to be where we're heading as a nation. Medical devices, pregnancy, right. and general information. If you're self surrendering, bring it with you. Bring you if you have a CPAP or bi BiPAP, show up with it. Di diabetics, you have a diabetic shoe, come with it. If you're pregnant, there are there are several programs in the uh, BOP. There's mo mo mothers and infants nurturing together program. There are several of them throughout the country. Uh, you can have a, an abortion, but you have to pay for it. You, If you have 
the Greenbrier is an interesting uh, program. It's in West Virginia. I believe you have to be in the last, uh, you're able to be there about a year or two. I'm, I don't recall, but I can get that information to you if you're, if you're interested. Um, that has the longest period of time where mother and infant can stay together. There are 20 rooms, two people to a room. The other programs of mother and infants nurturing together programs, not just in Texas, are just long enough to have the child a couple months and then back to prison. Sure. Diabetics. Um, personally, I think that the Federal Bureau of Prisons missed a boat regarding patient care, diabetics, and wearing of shoes. And I include this because while they say that you wear, they appear to say that the boots that they offer are the be all, do all, end all, the safety boots. And my own personal opinion is that that is not so. Uh, the fact that you're getting into a new boot, first off, with a steel toe, it can rub against the, the, the your foot on the inside. And that by itself, even though it's a little bit wider, that, that movement during gait can rub against the toe. Second, over a period of time, the fabric can wear down. Third, the most important thing is not the steel toe, is the fact that you need insoles on the bottom of the uh, on the bottom of the of the boot that you shouldn't have to pay for, and that that protects the bottom of the foot from ulcerate from from ulcerating that it protects the foot from shear forces from walking around day by day. And so that's the most important part. And unfortunately, this particular point in time, you have to buy them. And even those, I'm not sure that they're the best kind, but I believe that's all there is. I don't know. That's just my opinion. But as a foot doctor, I think it holds some water. Next, we're going to go into sentencing and how it all fits together. Suffice it to say is that there's a sentencing table. The first is on criminal history and the horizontal criminal history gives it's figured out by your attorney and across the top is that if you've had a prior sentence of greater than one year, one month, it's three points, another two points. If you had one for 60 days, not counted above, or one point for a prior sentence of less than 60 days. But there's a, for, there's a formula for figuring it, this all out. And this is all done according to i guess the links here you can't see them but i'm able to create these links and once you understand them it will place it places you so that in a certain guideline range for number of months this is something that you and your attorney need to very with detail go through and understand so that that guideline range is going to be very important regarding whether you fall into a minimum or a low uh, or higher facility. Next, I, I touched on this briefly before. If you're a veteran, there is one program in Morgantown, West Virginia. Um, uh, it is has a wing that's dedicated to veterans, as I said, that where they train service guide dog, dog service guide dogs for other veterans who have PTSD or disabilities that for other veterans who have disabilities. In addition, 
I have a link here. And again, all this I can, it, it's all in my website. But Catholic University had a law review where they actually showed that um, or they wrote about the positive effect of therapy for inmates as they work with dogs. And it's and it's true. It has a calming effect. Sure. Being a dog lover, I could say that that's true. BOP placement and how the security placement works. There's management variables and there's public safety factors. These are big deals because it also goes into the pattern and risk assessment scoring. And as you can see, I've labeled, let's see if I can make it easier to see here, for public safety factors, if you're deportable, alien, juvenile violence, these types of offenders, then that that's going to keep you from uh, participating in some of the first step back programming to get out early. And these become greater and greater. And so you may not be able to participate. But this is all point scored. Uh, and on the outside or female, blue is our male. And this takes time to go through. But again, I have all the information on the website where you can go in and figure that out. Or we can do that together. Again, this is this presentation is for attorneys, so most of this they already know. After you fill out everything, and let's say you're able to get at the sentencing hearing, the uh, the judge is willing to do a placement request for you. The caveat is that the BOP has the final say. It's based on bed space availability, and then they go into either programming needs that can be healthcare, psychology support, occupational training classes, et cetera, and aspirational, which is in, within 500 miles of your legal residence. <laughs> to determine where you're placed, oops, determine where you're placed, there's a program statement. And you can also find this on my website, but it's it's good to know, especially before you go into the pre-sentence interview, begin to become familiar with all of these terms. This is a program statement right here. And this tells you everything about where you're going. And I have all this on the website. Um, most of this, the lawyers already know. But management variables, public safety factors, this is, this is determined by the Federal Bureau of Prisons. The United States Sentencing Commission figures out they determine the length of sentence. The Bureau of Prisons just determines placement. For example, occupational trade training, Unicor, federal prison camp versus satellites. I say there's a difference. Essentially, they're basically the same. The only difference is that a satellite is attached to a higher security facility. Federal prison camp, FPC, is freestanding. So there's almost no fencing. And so it's really, the difference is, is that the overall uh environment of uh, the tenseness in the air, the atmosphere of the of the environment of the air is less tense in a federal prison camp as opposed to a satellite where anything that happens at the higher security facility, if there's a stabbing, if there's an escape, if there's a right, whatever happens there, if there's fog, whatever happens there, everybody gets locked down. And so, you you know, every, so it's a much more security oriented situation if you're at a satellite camp. So at this point, I make a little joke, if you will, as 
when I'm doing the presentation, that is sometimes somebody goes to sleep. And then we continue. Um. So, healthcare classifications, how does it work? So we went, we got, went through the different care levels, care levels one through four for mental, medical health care, care levels one through four for mental health care. So if you have a, if your mental health care level requires more um, health care than your medical care level, for example, if you have greater psychiatric needs than diabetic needs, then the psychiatric care level, that one, it, there's that rules where you get placed. Mental health has a higher priority because there's not as many facilities. That's my take on it. And so that will determine where you're placed. So you'll still get the medical care, but it's based on you, your initial care level placement is based on mental health and then you'll still have the medical care care level tied to that. Co-payments. Co-payments are essentially you won't have you'll have no co-payments as long as you had you go to the required medical uh, visits that are scheduled for you. But let's say you're in a fight, which I hope you're not, and you cause someone else to be injured. And they have to go to the to the health clinic. Then you have to pay for their visits or their copayments. If you just want to go to the, uh, if you just want to go to the care to the medical clinic, you know, even if it's a sound reason, and you can't get your a a BOP staff person to schedule you, even if you're not feeling well, I don't know how. By the letter of uh, the policy, uh, you, you may have to pay your copayment. So the only way that you cannot have be responsible for a copay is if staff schedule it for you. But if you just go, then it's on you. I'm not sure. I mean, that appears to be... Uh, how it works, again, if you go ahead and put in BOP and then put in that program statement, that will give you a greater heads up on what on how that works. We've already gone through activities of daily living versus prison activities of daily living, but giving it more detail, for people who are, you know, as the prison population is aging, dropping to the floor for alarms, someone a little older may not want to do. Standing for a head count, they may not understand. Ambulating, as I said, for a dining hall, well, they may not want to walk as fast or they may butt in line. Up and down stairs may be slow. Hearing and understanding orders from staff, they, they may not want to be yelled at. They may argue back. And the big one climbing up and to an up and down from an upper bunk. That's that's a hip fracture waiting to happen, and so all of these are problems, and they can result in, you know, if someone has starts getting infractions or punishments, they can wind up with discipline problems, restrictive housing units, solitary confinement. And that exacerbates their mental illness. Nobody's going to be good. And isolation is just going to create a bigger problem. Not probably that being not properly diagnosed with a mental illness before you get in there, then they have fights, self injurious behavior. You're going to have more discipline. Then you know that cascading problem disciplinary consequences, restrictive housing units, and solitary confinement. This attorney has his article, and again, to the website, you can find it, I believe, 
where in the nick of time, you know, this person had multiple personalities. And most of these judges and attorneys, for the most part, most people think that it's not really accurate. Let's see if I can pull this up. I don't know if I can. It'd be interesting. There we go. So this is, you know, the article. And then, it, but it had, it appeared that he had multiple personalities. Again, this is a PowerPoint meant for attorneys, but I think you're getting the point. There's 10 psychology program options. There's more now. The challenge is, is that there are some programs where there's only, there's a limited. Let's see. Uh, two look I may be able to, we may get to these shortly. I'm going to skip this and I'm, I'm going to bring these up before we're done. Dementia. As I was talking about earlier, so if someone is senior where it goes to prison activities of daily living, if the if not if you know someone who's unfortunate if someone's unfortunate enough to be is current or being treated for dementia, myself and attorney Faye Spence was proud enough we were public we published two chapters in a book that was published by the american bar association representing people with dementia but the cut to the chase there's only one prison in the country that has 35 beds at federal medical center devons that's nuts you know no matter what else is out there that's it and so the option is what do you do prosecute or protect people with them. I mean, that is just, this is a whole separate category in people that have dementia. It's, it is incarcerating people with mental illness is not going to fix them. And so we've gone as a nation from having hospitals that treated mental illness to incarcerating people with mental illness. So not a good place to be. As I said, for Devin, these are the common medications to treat it that are not on formulary at uh, the Federal Bureau of Prisons. These are the three medications that are on formulary right here. Medication availability, again, some medicine, some things that can be available to the patient inmate is going to be the EpiPen and this other auto injector. My point here in the picture is that the same medication generics are made. There are multiple manufacturers that make the same medication in different that's that differ in color, shape, and size. And so that's the purpose of that picture. But before you even make it to your pre-sentence interview, you need to know, are you, is your medication on formulary, not formulary, or just not available? And so, I mean, I was educated. I mean, I'm the doctor. And when I went in, is it almost 20 years ago, I wasn't prepared, which is why, I mean, I'm grateful in 2010, I got my license back to practice. But I wasn't prepared when I went in. And then when I went to get my medications, they weren't all that. Most were okay, but a couple were not. Which is why I changed course and decided over time to begin to work with other justice impacted people like yourselves. So that all of you could be prepared because I was very unprepared. 
So going into Federal Bureau of Prisons with substance abuse. So Federal Bureau of Prisons has three on that are on formulary right here, but they're only treating 2% of the more than 15,000 available. In the States, these are, this is the drugs that uh, Purple says they're being treated. Orange says they're not getting treated. And in the middle, you can tell the difference is color-coded. So if I went here, let's see what happens here when I click on that. I'm experimenting while I try and learn how to use this together. Prevent overdoses. Okay. So that's where I got that. I thought it was going to give me a chart. And so, so even if these meth medications are there and you happen to be being treated for an opioid addiction, and this is the medications that you're being given and you're having to surrender, or you were taken into the BOP, somehow or another, this information needs to get from the your attorney and the prescribing physician into your pre-sentence report, into the court, and somehow or another into uh, somehow into the BOP where they cannot leave you hanging without anything. And I, at this point, I don't have an answer for that other than the administrative remedy process, which I know how to do and how to talk you through it, which is something that the BOP encourages you to how to self-advocate for yourself. The challenge is, is that you're probably not in the physical condition to even hold a pen to do this. But that's another uh, YouTube or someone can reach out to me. Moving forward. Second opinions. This is how the BOP, they, they break down how they're going to provide care. And they break it down into life-threatening, they're going to give you treatment. Medically necessary, probably. Medically necessary, not urgent, uh, you're likely not going to get it. You're not going to get it here, and you're not going to get it there. Second opinion, consults. Okay. A reason why you want to have your pre-sentence report complete, because if it's incomplete, you're already starting out behind the eight ball, for one. For two, if it's complete and, the, and your need for a surgical procedure is imminent, then it's up to you and your attorney and the physician to research the medical policy in the Federal Bureau of Prisons to ensure that you word the pre-sentence interview correctly so that you get designated to a federal medical center the first time. Otherwise, you're going to go through a lot of pain and frustration and delay because you'll get into a prison you're going to have to fight for a second opinion consult once it can take up to six months to 18 months to maybe say that they're going to say okay it could take another six months to three years to get the appointment and then once you get the appointment with a consultant in the community. The Federal Bureau of Prisons does not have to follow that consultant's recommendation. They could just file it. That's it. They don't have to give you that care. All they've got to do is the only thing they're obligated to do is provide the consultant second opinion. That's it. And so that's why it's super important to make sure everything is documented up front.
again, repeating myself, that's why everything needs to be accurate. Self-surrendering is another tricky, tricky talk, topic. <clears throat> you want to ensure a smooth transition, especially if it is your first time, for sure. I can tell you this personally because it was my first time at one point. And so... You wind up going, you self-surrender at any place other than a federal prison camp to a low or a satellite camp. You surrender, you're scanned, you're given a change of clothes only to find out that the court's paperwork is not there. At least that's what happened to me. And by not being there, <clears throat> At the time, I guess for me, the paperwork was mailed. Now they say it's electronically sent. And from my perspective, for something to be electronically sent, it has to be input by a human. And then it has to be humanly sent. So if it's not sent, then it should have been sent, but maybe it wasn't but you can't guarantee that everything is done correctly the first time. So what happens? Well, you're going to be put in solitary confinement and the guard will tell you, like he told me, you can be here up to a year, up to a month. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. And so does this happen? The answer is yes. It's not a very good first day. But so what do you do? Well, guess what? President Reagan, trust but verify. You know, your attorney should go ahead and verify with the prison that the judge's orders are there. You can verify that they were there by calling that particular prison or checking that the information is there. But, you know, if this is happening to you like it was happening to me, I, uh, you know, I was a deer in headlights. And so it just didn't, it wasn't on my mind that the information could not be there. And so therefore, I just assumed that I assumed wrong. So it's better if the attorney could call and make sure that the court, that their judgment commitment order, that the marshal's paperwork, and that the court's paperwork is at the as at the prison before you arrive, <clears throat> and then you can bring with you you can bring with you security card copies of your social security card, driver's license, birth certificate. You can uh, bring with you a in an envelope if you have large medical records. They should be on your paper. They should be in your pre-sentence report, but if you want to bring them with you, copies in a big envelope, just label the envelope legal mail. You can also have uh, on the back of one of a one page of your uh, case from your legal case, you could type onto it all of the your name, your contact list of the person's name, phone number, address, email. And then put that in an envelope called legal mail. Uh, if you want to bring, if you're coming into a federal prison camp, you can bring cash with you. If you come in for like, I don't know, $320, $350. If you're going into a satellite camp, you can bring $350 to a low. If you're going to bring, you can also have, I wouldn't bring thousands of dollars. You don't want to bring lots of money, not on your first go round. Or you can go to Western Union and or MoneyGram and check your follow the directions on my website or on the A from the from the your prison's website, just get the A and O handbook and they will give you all the information there so that the money will be there by the time you arrive. 
So yes, all this information can be done and make sure that all the information is there so this all could be avoided. What to bring, again, in addition to what I just said, prescriptions, you can also bring medical devices. You can bring medications with you, uh, especially weekends and holidays, as they may be used. At worst, they can be thrown out. Three to four weeks supply. You can bring wedding band Bible with you. Anything under $100. <clears throat> Long haulers for COVID. Um, if you're a diagnosed COVID long hauler, this has to be brought up between you, your attorney, and your doctor, because especially if you are at the peak in symptoms, so I don't know that any hosp any any prisoner in jail can care for you. By that I mean, if you are peak system peak in sim symptoms, where all you can do is like sleep, get up, go to the bathroom, sleep, get up, go to the bathroom, get something to eat. If that's it, then you're in no condition to submit, go to, you know, to uh, self-surrender or go to jail. It just can't happen. And then as you, but it's going to be like that for a while. And so your attorney needs to work out something with the court. Um, then I've gone into, you know, that I I think I've addressed this, that um, if you have, if you ha if you had your COVID vaccines, you can bring copies of your, your, your verification of your vaccines, flu vaccines. If you haven't had the vaccines, either way, before you go, you can check on the BOP website and they have a modified uh, operation level for COVID it seems that like most of the COVID is beginning to diminish. Um, just know that if, in fact, when you get there, that, you know, if there is some degree of COVID or flu virus, they may stick you in isolation for a little bit. That's why I'm saying that part of what I like people to do is start sending in books to read a couple of days before they get there. Again, that's another YouTube because having books to read if you're in solitary confinement will take the edge off a great deal. Again, uh, just a thought, but this slide, I'm mostly paying attention to those who have long-term effects of COVID. If you're going to be designated to a private contract facility, here, there could be, this is where there are questions. Um, I don't know. If for private facilities, this is where maybe the attorney needs to connect with the prison and find out what they have. Do they have what specific psychology programs? What, prob what first step back programs do they have? Because they're not listed anywhere. You can't go online and find out. What medical care they have? Do they have? They don't have it by care level. It appears because it's not available online. All of this information is hidden online. Um, are there requirements for psychology program eligibility? Just there is no for sort of first step back programming. Do they abide by that first step back programming? In other words, for for credit earned time credits towards early release. There. There is um, there's just nothing online. Now that may be because private these co co private contract prisons may be just for those that are um, immigrants or from you know other countries. In which case, first step back may not apply. But this is just you know information to think about. Additional resources, these are all, you can find them through my website uh, by going there, pretty uh, simple to do. I don't need to go through that. Lastly, as a final thought, it's my responsibility. Let me clean up my picture here. 
responsible for a client's medical physical health should be safeguarded in order to protect them from themselves and others, providing a safe environment for the duration of their, their in court incarceration is the responsibility of the court and defense team and BOP. And next, uh, again, a little bit of this claim where I just, this is meant to be used solely as a mitigation aid in the sentencing and prison placement decision-making process. And last, uh, this is thanking them for the attorney to present. Again, this is my presentation to attorneys. And so I hope you found this helpful. Uh, I realize it's been long and I appreciate you taking the time to listen. So it's been a little bit of a different presentation slant on from one of how I normally present to all of you. But any questions, give me a call. I have a safe day and thanks for giving me your time.